I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. Cats and dogs, rats and bats, even kangaroos. This episode is about animals and our long-standing relationship with some of them, like cats and dogs as well as a few interesting tidbits about a few other animals and how they may impact our well-being. For many of us, animals are or have been at some point in our life our companions. Maybe the goldfish you won at a contest as a child, which may have prompted a lesson in life and death sooner than contemplated. It could be your trusted dog or the cat that curls up alongside you when he or she, not you, wants. It might be that rabbit that you rescued from the side of the road and whose life you saved. Animals could be our service workers, therapists, and at times, our eyes and ears. Large animals supplied power to drive machines and transport people and goods thousands of years ago. In the ancient Near East, goats and sheep were among the earliest animals to be domesticated. They were an everyday feature of life and were commonly depicted by artists who lived in agricultural communities in, for example, ancient Greece and medieval Europe. There are depictions of horses dating back almost 40,000 years, and a painting of pigs discovered in a cave in Indonesia is said to be at least 45,000 years old. And ancient Egyptians worshipped many animals for thousands of years. Animals were revered for different reasons. Dogs were valued for their ability to protect and hunt, but cats, they were thought to be the most special. Egyptians believed cats were magical creatures capable of bringing good luck to the people who housed them. And to honor these treasured pets, wealthy families dressed them in jewels and fed them treats fit for royalty. When the cats died, they were mummified. As a sign of mourning, the cat owners shaved off their eyebrows and continued to mourn until their eyebrows grew back. Art from ancient Egypt shows statues and paintings of every type of feline, and cats were so special that those who killed them, even by accident, were sentenced to death. As for our domesticated companions, some say that our dogs are the descendants of the wolf and were first domesticated around 10,000 years ago, while others say it may have been as far back as 30,000 years originating in perhaps Europe, the Middle East, or in East Asia. Some think early human hunter-gatherers actively tamed and bred wolves, while other research suggests wolves were domesticated by themselves by scavenging the carcasses left by human hunters or by loitering around campfires, growing tamer with each generation until they became our permanent companions, our dogs. As for cats, studies suggest that domestic cats descended from a Middle Eastern wildcat and were first domesticated in the Near East around 12,000 years ago. It's been said that when humans were predominantly hunters, dogs were of particularly great use and so were domesticated long before cats. It seems the cats, on the other hand, became useful to us when our ancestors roamed less and began to settle down tilling the earth, and most importantly, storing their surplus crops. And why is that? Well, with the storage of grain came mice and other rodents, and so when the first wild cats wandered into towns and villages, the stage was set for what's been referred to as one of the most successful biological experiments ever undertaken. You see, the cats were delighted by the abundance of prey in the storehouses, and people, in turn, were equally as delighted by the new pest control that cats instinctively brought with them. The many ways in which pets interact with their owners on a daily basis shows what pivotal positions they hold. Many treat their pets the way they might treat another person, actually. In some instances, pets are treated far better. According to published studies, it seems that over the past 30 years or so, human-pet relationships have grown closer. In 2019, for example, Americans spent 
almost $96 billion on their pets. And the trend for decades now has been known as the humanization of pets. It seems it's more common to view our four-legged friends as fully-fledged members of our family, not simply animals. The New York Times has reported that 70% of pet owners say they sometimes sleep with their pets. 65% buy Christmas gifts for their pets. 25% cook special meals for their pets. And a somewhat unfortunate statistic is that 40% of married women with pets who were surveyed said they get more emotional support from their pets than from their husbands. According to a national pet owner's survey, almost 30% of cat and dog owners said they throw annual birthday parties for their pets. And then there's something called anthropomorphism. There's personification and anthropomorphism. Personification is sometimes used to represent an abstract concept in human form. For example, in reference to our laws, you've probably heard it said that justice is blind. But we know that justice is a concept and obviously doesn't have eyes, so it can't really be blind. And although you may love the sound of raindrops dancing on the roof, rain isn't capable of dancing. And that Snickers bar, it isn't actually calling your name nor is the sun smiling down on you. Those are examples of personification. Anthropomorphism, on the other hand, refers to something that's not human behaving or being treated as human. It's a term used when we apply human behaviors to animals. We often see it applied in children's stories to teach concepts or to help make abstract ideas easier to understand. Think Peter Rabbit from The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter. Peter, who wears a blue jacket with brass buttons and shoes, lives with his widowed mother and his sisters, Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, in a rabbit hole that has a kitchen and plenty of furniture. Then there's Winnie the Pooh, the cat in the hat, Snoopy the dog from the Peanuts cartoon strip, and Garfield the cat, as well as Charlotte from Charlotte's Web, to name just a few. And if I were to say the word Fido, chances are great that you would immediately think dog. And if I said Tabby, you'd likely think cat. There really is no more cliched name for a dog than Fido. And it's so overworked that most people no longer name their dog Fido. It's nowhere to be found on the lists of popular dog names. And when the word Fido is used today, it's usually to generically refer to pretty much any dog. So how is it that the name Fido became synonymous with a pet dog? The answer? It's actually Abraham Lincoln. Before he became our 16th president and was a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln had a dog named Fido. That dog was always with Lincoln and it was a common sight to see him walking down the street with Fido alongside. And as he pursued the goal of being elected president, his political handlers apparently worked to repackage this bright, genius, and ambitious man as a man of the people. They constructed the still familiar Lincoln legend, a child studying by the light of a candle in his log cabin, splitting rails, and a man with a faithful companion, Fido. Soon, Fido became one of the most popular names for a dog for generations to come. And by the way, the name actually derives from a Latin word that means to trust, to believe, and to confide in. Abraham Lincoln was also the first president to bring cats into the White House. His cats, Tabby and Dixie, were gifts from Secretary of State William Seward. Ever the pet lover, Lincoln was known to have rescued three motherless kittens while visiting General Ulysses Grant during the Civil War. And here's an interesting but somewhat unsettling tidbit. In Great Britain, some researchers believe the trend toward naming pets with human names and treating them like children could be attributed in part to a reduction in the UK's birth rate. This is also associated with an increased use of terms like mummy and daddy used to describe people's relationships with their pets on gravestones. And take this for what it is. 
In 2019, when the UK birth rate hit an all-time low, nine out of every 10 names given to the puppies and kittens in Great Britain were also shared by Britain's newborn babies. Animals can play an important part in the healing process for those who experience abuse or trauma, including veterans who served during wartime. Some farmers station peacocks to watch over their land and livestock. Law enforcement depends on canines to track and capture suspects and identify bombs and narcotics. The Navy employs combat dolphins to detect underwater mines and the presence of enemy swimmers. And the Marines, they've used mules in a variety of missions by transporting weapons, ammunition, and other supplies through difficult terrain. And although rats may get a bad rap, with their keen sense of smell and trainability, they've been found to be exceptionally suited to work as landmine detectors. More efficient than metal detectors, less costly than training dogs, some rats, referred to as hero rats by the company that trains and utilizes them, sniffs out the chemical compounds of TNT found in landmines and other explosive remnants of war. And that same international company, they train rats to detect tuberculosis. A trained rat can actually sample 100 samples for TB in as little as 20 minutes, something that would typically take a lab technician up to four days using conventional microscopy. And moving from rats to bats, while much of the world sleeps, vampire bats emerge from dark caves, mines, tree hollows, and abandoned buildings in Mexico and Central and South America. And yes, there really are such things as vampire bats. Like the legendary monster they're named after, these small mammals drink the blood of other animals, mostly cows, pigs, horses, and birds, in order to survive. But rest assured, they don't actually harm the animals. In fact, they're so light and graceful that they can sometimes alight for more than 30 minutes without the host animal even awakening. It seems there's a protein in the vampire bat's saliva that might one day benefit stroke sufferers. You know, it's often said that time is brain relative to strokes. And so researchers have studied the enzyme in the vampire bat's saliva, that anticoagulant that's become known as, of all things, draculin, that keeps the blood flowing and may have a beneficial effect on stroke victims. And turning back to dogs again for a moment, anyone who's owned a dog knows they have a far keener sense of smell than we humans do. With more than 200 million accurate scent receptors to our measly 5 million, dogs can smell things that seem unfathomable to us. Their noses are powerful enough to detect substances at concentrations of one part per trillion. That's like a single drop of liquid in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And that sense of smell, it's so subtle that dogs are even able to notice the slightest change in human scent that's caused by disease. The tiniest shifts in hormones or certain organic compounds released by diseased cells can be detected by some dogs that have been trained to sniff out disease markers in people that might go unnoticed, even by early medical testing. They've been trained to sniff out a variety of types of cancers, including skin, breast, and bladder cancer, as well as malaria, by recognizing the distinctive scent of children infected with the malarial parasites from their socks. And trained dogs can warn owners with diabetes when their blood sugar has dropped dangerously low. The dogs apparently detect something called isoprene, a common natural chemical found in human breath that rises significantly during episodes of low blood sugar. Trained dogs can also alert their owners with epilepsy when they're on the verge of a seizure and are being taught to detect Parkinson's disease years before symptoms appear. Trained dogs can also help predict migraines. For those who suffer migraines, having a warning before one comes on can mean the difference between managing the problem or succumbing to hours of pain. 
In one study, the majority of migraine sufferers with trained dogs noticed changes in their dog's behavior during or preceding their migraines. It may be that migraine alert dogs hone in on the scent of something called serotonin, a chemical that seems to skyrocket before a migraine. The dogs will lick their owner, circle or nudge them, stay by their side, stare at them, or begin barking. And in one pilot study from Helsinki, dogs are being taught to recognize the previously unknown odor signature of the COVID-19 disease. Here's the thought. Dogs can understand more than 150 words. That's understand, not say. And according to several behavioral measures, the mental abilities of most dogs are close to a human child between the ages of two and two and a half. And anyone who owns a dog knows this. They're capable of deliberately trying to deceive other dogs and people in order to get rewards. It's been said they're nearly as successful in deceiving humans as humans are in deceiving their dogs. It appears that cats, well, they can understand object permanence. That is, they're able to recognize that when an object disappears from sight, it still continues to exist. This kind of recognition is also a cognitive milestone for human infants. And cats, they usually understand around 20 to 40 words, although some are noted to understand as many as 50 words, according to scientific research. So, speaking of cats and dogs, is there any truth behind the adage that cats and dogs are natural-born enemies? It seems that the answer is no. They are not natural enemies. The truth is that there are a few behavioral differences at their core that can set those two breeds of animals apart. The one that causes the most difficulty when it comes to peaceful interspecies relationship is called prey drive. It seems that dogs, even the smallest of breeds, retain some of the hunting instincts that served their wild ancestors, including the wolf. This instinct helps explain why dogs love to chase pretty much any moving object, whether it's a stick, a ball, a frisbee, a squirrel, or a cat. Since many cats flee upon seeing a dog, it's easy to see how relations can quickly deteriorate. Dogs enjoy chasing cats not because they hate them, but because a fast-moving feline triggers a strong, natural instinct that takes a fair amount of training and socialization of the dog to override. There's also the fact that although both cats and dogs are domesticated animals and pets, they are two very distinct kinds of animals who communicate very differently. For example, while a wagging tail on a golden retriever may indicate playfulness, a twitching, switching tail on your cat is usually a sign of irritation. Dogs that misread those signals may end up receiving a swipe at their nose by a bothered cat. And felines may learn to distrust dogs after getting chased around the block one too many times. As recently as the late 1800s, cats and dogs freely roamed the streets. Competition over scarce scraps of food led to frequent fights. Disputes between two dogs is often resolved without actual fighting since dogs have inherited a sophisticated set of signals from their pack-dwelling ancestors, like the wolf, that enables them to signal their intention to back down if they consider their opponent too fearsome. On the other hand, cats are descended from solitary predators with little need to communicate face to face. And a small but growing number of studies shows that cats match dogs in many tests of social intelligence, possibly transforming the widespread image of cats as aloof or untamed. It seems, though, that cats' famed aloofness extends even to the laboratory, the problem being researchers' attempts to cajole cats into giving up a glimpse into their minds is often blocked by the cat's preferences to just be doing something else, anything else. The research on cat and dog cognition has confirmed what pet owners already know. Dogs are attentive and responsive and often very needy. While cats don't care what you want, 
and they don't want your help. And here's one in interesting tidbit about an animal from the other side of the world, the kangaroo. These large Australian marsupials are known for their ability to hop great distances, which is the primary way they get around. And that hopping movement, it's called saltation. During saltation, kangaroos push off with both large feet at the same time, and they use their tails for balance. That combination of the muscular legs, big feet, and tails may help kangaroos move forward effectively, but they prevent kangaroos from going in reverse. And because of that forward movement only, well, it's one of the primary reasons you'll find a kangaroo on the Australian coat of arms, symbolizing the way the nation chooses to move forward. And the country's same coat of arms, it depicts an emu. Emus can't walk backwards either. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn and consider this. Mark Twain once said, if you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he'll not bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and a man.